Thank you everybody to be here and listening to this very special subject, gender medicine. Um, I must say I'm new to gender medicine. I think we are all are because it's not um, a subject we have for several years now. It's something very new. And I try to give you an introduction in this new subject and um, I try to make you interested in the thinking of gender medicine. Um, I start with an example. I had, you might hear it, um, my voice is a little bit um, like um, coarse and um, I had kind of a little flu the last days and George said today, oh, you might take some ibuprofen. And can you imagine, is there a difference in ibuprofen taken by a man or by a woman? Do you know it? Yeah? Uh, women metabolize it faster, so their effect, like, you require a higher dose for, uh, like, the same effect. Yeah, very good. Um, so, I, did I get it right? Um, women metabol metabolize it faster, so um, women need more dose, or if you gave the same dose to women than to men, it's less use for women. So I decided not to use it. I took paracetamol. Do you know the difference in women and men with paracetamol? It is one. It's the same. Um, um, it's the same effect, but it's much more toxic in women than in men. So um, women die faster from taking too much paracetamol. So that's only you know. It's just a very short example of today, um, of a very um, yeah. What I just um, felt I will start with. So where's my here? So. Um, This is the gender person and sometimes it's quite um, important to start at the very beginning and to start at the beginning is to start with words, you know, what does gender and sex mean? So at the moment gender is kind of political subjects and it's um, written a lot about it and um, it's in Switzerland, where I'm coming from, or in Germany, there's a lot of discussion about um, are people are able to say, I'm male, I'm not a male, and um, there's kind of speech and kind of language. But what we really th should start with is to be sure what does, what does it mean? And so there are four different um, subjects you should know about. We start with the biological sex. So we have female, we have male and we have something in between that's intersex. That's due to chromosomal differences or due to um, um, antibody problems. Or th I'm okay. It's okay? Better like this? Yeah? No chains? Mm -hmm. And so that's what we call sex. Um, in Germany, we don't have a word for sex and one for gender. We have one word for both. That makes it more difficult for German people understanding what is meant. So um, then we have gender quite above, you know. So sex is your go nuts, to be honest. Um, gender is in your brain. And that's the thing how I feel I am. Do I feel male? Do I feel like a woman? Do I feel like a man? Do I feel gender queer? That's something in between. Or do I don't feel like a woman or a man at all? Or do I don't want that anybody thinks I am a man or a woman? Then it's called non-binaire. Um, that's quite complicated because um, you can be that and these. Okay. Then we have a sexual orientation that's in your heart. That's like your emotions are going. Um, am I attracted to a man? Am I attracted to a woman? So I'm a sex heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual or asexual. And then the last one, that's a frame. It's like you want to be looked at. So it's a gender expression. Do I look feminine? Do I look masculine or something in between? And you can combine these four elements as you want to. And then it's getting very complicated. But today in gender medicine, we are only talking about sex and gender.
So we are not talking about gender expression or the sexual orientation. That's nothing we talk about. And we are not talking about um, gender queer or intersex because that's not our topic today. We are talking about gender medicine. That means gender, um, gender is a subject of um, our medical profession. So is there any reasons we should treat men and women differently? Um, why is gender medicine exciting? That's a lot of people asking me. Why all of a sudden people talk about gender medicine? It wasn't a subject for ages. Why now? You know, when I was a medical student, it might be the same for you. Gender medicine was no subject at all. We just developed children medicine. We just understood that children are not small adults. But um, that was the only difference we made. Um, about 10 years ago it started that obese people maybe need different medical treatment than small people, you know. We have this um, special medicine for very um, obese person, um, but still men and women wasn't much of a difference. But now um, gender medicine starts. Why? Why is it so exciting at the moment? I think it's two reasons. The one is we have a change in feeling how medicine is working. For about 200 years we had a, a philosophy in medicine that meant we are kind of biomechanical way of working. Something is broken, go to the doctor, he will repair it. And that is changing to a new biopsychosocial model of medicine where we all um, where we want to see um, how is the surrounding, how is the social life, how is the feeling of the, of the person. Because we now understand health, health is more than just the body. And the body is more than just functioning. And um, gender medicine is very much of a new model. The second one is we tend to go to a medicine that is more and more individualized, more personalized. We talk about, we have a lot of genetic specialists sitting here, you know, that's, that's very nice. They're very good people and, and they are on their way developing a medicine that is more and more spe specialized for the individual. We don't have the same tablets for everybody. We make a tablet for this person and this illness. And it might be different because people need different um, tablets, they need different medicine. And on this way, <coughs> The gender medicine can help us a lot because it's, a very, it's, a, it's still a very easy um, separation to say we have men and women, but it's a way on the, into the direction of the personalized medicine. And so um, it's a good model to learn how to treat people um, differently and to think what do we need for getting better in this. So. What people ask as well, is this woman medicine? Is it only for women? Is it a female medicine? And I say, no, it's not. And this is um, just a part of an interview I gave about two months ago, where they ask me, is that Frauen medicine, women medicine? No, it's not. Gender medicine is not women's medicine. I'm a gynecologist, I know what women's medicine is. But gender is different. Gender medicine means we want to have the best medicine for men and for women in the way that we just see what they need because of their gender and their sex. Um, we've done this first course at the University of Lucerne and it was um, in Switzerland that's a very new development. It's the first big course we have in Switzerland for medical students. It's a 28 um, hour course for six year students, students. so um, it's new. Um, you see that's the UN goals, you all know the 17 goals of the UN and we have um, health and well-being for all, we have um, um, gender equality and what else we have um, reduced inequalities and so it's still an international goal to say um, care about gender, it's a topic. So we start from scratch and the World Health Organization have done the first, they always do the surveys, you know, who is living the longest and um, what are people dying from. And in 2019, the first time they made a differentiation between 
um, the gender. So that's very important for us. And I'll just give you a few marks um, which is quite good to know. So you have a feeling for the differences between health in men and women. So if you are born in 2019 and you are a boy, and that's for all the world, it's not for Cyprus, not for Switzerland, for all the world, you are going to be nearly 70 years old. If you are born, um, um, born as a girl, you will be 74 years old. So there's a four years difference worldwide between men and women. That's five years longer than 20 years ago. That's quite an improvement. But if you are born in a rich country like Cyprus or Switzerland, you live 18 years longer than if you are born into a poor country. And what's very funny, um, if you are born to a rich country, the difference between men and women in survivorship is seven years. It's longer than the worldwide difference. Why? Have you an idea why? Because we still have a big problem in the pregnancy and birth um, um, things in the poorer countries. Women are still dying a lot from being pregnant and giving birth to babies. And we don't have this problem in the richer countries. So in the richer countries we have a seven, in Switzerland we have an eight year difference between male and woman survivorship. That's much, isn't it? Seven years? Boah. If, if I would be a male, you know, I would say, we have to change it, that's not fair, you know? Um, and for the women, they are very alone when they get older. And that's something the older women really fears, you know, because at birth, for 100 um, girls, there are 107 boys. Nature is very clever, isn't it? <laughs> but when, when the woman is 60 years old, there's only 95 male left for 100 women. And if she gets 80, 85, only 60. And if she's 100, there's only 30, male, 30, 30 men left for 100 women. So the men are really dying quite early, isn't it? Yeah, you can see it if you are more visual people, you can say it. So, why do the men die earlier than the women? It's they have a more unhealthy lifestyle, you know? So, they have more nicotine five times. They have more alcohol four times and they eat more red meat than women do. Then, men go to the doctor less often if they have the same illnesses than women. Um, men die more often of unnatural causes, and that's the same in the poorer and in the richer countries. So they have more traffic accidents, two times, more suicides, two times, and more murders. Um, and men die more often from diseases. Okay, maybe that's um, due to the unhealthy lifestyle, but still, of the 40 diseases that most frequently lead to death, 33 affect men more often. And that's like um, um, lung cancer or other heart diseases or COPD, stroke, cirrhosis of the liver, tuberculosis, all this stuff. Men are more prone to get these illnesses and die of it. Okay, <clears throat> that's just an example. That's Swiss data. And you see that's um, overweight. And that's the man, that's the woman, and you see overweight is still more frequent in the male than in the female. The same with tobacco use, and that's fruit and vegetable consumption, and male tend to eat much less fruit and vegetables than females do. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to look at anybody special, so, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, if you are going to be a doctor, and most of you will be a doctor, what diseases do you have to deal with if you want to do a good gender medicine? Um, I think you really have, what you, what you should do first is to see these um, topics, what leads to the gender specific differences, you know? It's, I think it's not enough to say, oh, what illnesses do I have to learn, where, what's different? So you have to really see what are the different 
differences between female health and male health. So the first is the surrounding. So you have genetic um, discrepancies, you have different chromosomes, different hormones, different metabolism, different environment, culture, society. That all plays a role. Then you have um, epigenetics, you have fetal programming, everything like this who really plays a role. Then there's a perception of patients themselves and of doctors towards their patients. I will give you some examples. The health behavior you have to take into account like are people um, make use of preventions? Do they go to the doctor or not? Then are there different signs of, of um, diseases? Um, in therapy are there different um, kinds of metabolism or different study results. So you can have gender differences in all these topics and that makes it quite complicated and usually they are combined. But what is very important for me to know and it's very important for you, you don't need to have gender medicine as a subject in school. That's not the point. But you have to learn that for every illness or for every um, disease you study, you should just have into account maybe there are differences between men and women and I have to take into account and you should ask your teachers, is there a difference? Do I have to treat women different than male? Or do this disease prevent um, shows differently in male and women? So gender medicine is not a subject in a way it should be a part of every subject we study, you know. But that will take a long time, you know, really to have it in every university. So that's just a selection of diseases. We know a lot of differences, but there are some more. And I just show you a few. And what I don't want to do, we don't go in the deep, um, in the deep dive in the diagnosis and in the diseases. It's just examples for you to get an impression what you should care about in your future, you know. So we start with the heart attack, but you can really say nearly every cardiovascular disease has a gender sensitive perspective. They are all different in a way. That's heart attack and most important is um, the symptoms in men and women are quite different. And if you don't know that there are differences in symptoms, you don't do the right diagnosis. If you wait for a woman to have the same symptoms than a man, you will, maybe she's dead already until you, you realize it's a heart attack. Because you know all the symptoms of a, of a male with a heart attack. I think you have this in medical school all the time. In females, it's much longer. They sometimes are just tired, they have problems in sleeping but are always a little bit dizzy and they have more um, like um, have pain in their stomach or pain in the back. It's, it's very unspecific and of course they can have all the male symptoms as well but they won't have them um, every time and maybe not as clearly as the male have. So it's very important to know symptoms in a heart attack are different in women than in men. And there are some other gaps, we call it a gender gap, you have in a heart attack. For example, in incidence, um, of course it's a male disease still, but it's much more females getting it nowadays than in former days. And you should know that there's, it's, it's, a, it's a real probability for a woman to have a heart attack. Um, stress increases the risk in women more than a man. So if a, if a female has stress, she gets a heart attack more easily than a man. Um, the diagnosis in women is made with delay due to nobody's recognizing it. Um, it's more difficult and if somebody thinks it could be a heart attack, women are not taken that serious. They are often sent away home from the emergency room again. Is that no, oh, that's maybe you just have eaten something wrong, just go home, you know, and then she's dying. So therapy starts with delay, we know that in women, and treatment is less forced by the, um, by the, by the um, medics, and um, the gender specific reference values are missing because they are different in female and male. The outcome is that women die more often from heart attack than male. And that's really a problem. They die more often in the short time and in the long time. And um, 
they are less often take part in the rehab programs, what they should. But usually they don't do it because they have to care for their husband, for example. So they go home after hospital and don't have a rehab. Um, medicine, they are underrepresented in studies and we know that quite a lot of the heart um, drugs um, are not tested in women and are in the wrong dose. So we can't take it for granted that what we are learned is the right dose for men, is the right dose for women. So much of the, of the drugs may be overdosed, but we don't know. We should do all the studies again. Um, that's just an example, heart attack. Next is um, lung cancer. Every cancer, in fact, has a gender um, bias, um, but that's um, the lung cancer. And what we know that um, women have a higher risk of lung cancer if they smoke the same amount of cigarettes. So if you have a young girl start, starting smoking, you should stop, make her stop because um, she's so much more prone to get a lung cancer from smoking than a man, three times more often. So it's not just dangerous, it's three times more dangerous if a woman smokes than a man smokes. I think um, a lot of the young women don't know this. If they should know, maybe they would stop, you know. And, um, they get the adenocarcinomas after fewer pec years than the men and they get more COPD, much more faster than the men do. So cigarette smoking is much more um, 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 aggressive for women than for men. It's because they have another DNA repair capacity and they have a, a CYP1 expression that is higher due to the estrogen levels and there's a lot of other um, factors influencing this. But it's important to know, you know. The only good thing is um, they live longer when having a lung cancer, but still you don't want to have a lung cancer, you know. Next topic is um, depression. Um, all, all of the psychiatric issues have a gender specific aspect and I only show you de de depression and RDS. So if you see the suicides per year, and that's the Swiss data, you see that men suicide themselves three times more often than females. And most of the suicides are due to a major depression. And we all think depression is much more higher in females than in male, but that's not true. It's, it's true for the male depressions, you know, for this, um, in the male depression it's about 30% against 20% lifetime risk. Um, so it's more women than men. But for severe depression it's the same, you know. So men get depressions in the same frequency than female. And just let's go through this very shortly. It's, um, we have a genetic predisposition, that's true. We have, um, women have this estrogen um, problem that makes them more depressive. We have social and relationship disorders and professional and financial problems, um, which all makes um, depressions. The perception of the patient is depression is a woman's disease. So a man usually don't want to go Want, don't want to be diagnosed with a depression because that's not male, you know. So, and the doctor has the same perception. Um, and there's one very nice study, it's a German study, that doctors diagnose women three times more often with a depression than men, even if they have got the same symptoms, you know. And it doesn't matter if it's a female or a male doctor, they do it wrong both. And the study was done with simulation patients. So they went to the doctor, to female doctors and to male doctors with the same symptoms of um, depression. And the females have been diagnosed three times more often with depression than the males. So we have to see this to know that even the doctors have a big bias, you know, in, in doing the di diagnosis. And to the men, the doctors often say, oh, take a break, then you will be fine. And that's a big disadvantage for male, you know, because they go outside and suicide themselves. So it is a problem. Um, the symptoms are a little bit different. 
Um, like you see in the women, you have more like hopelessness, sadness, lack of drive, inner emptiness. And the work and the men, they they work even more. They show anger, aggression, self-aggression, or addiction, and they feel they don't want to be helped. The women, they try to commit suicide, but it's just a cry for help, so they don't do it correctly. The male don't want to be helped, so they are successful. Um, one other example is um, the attention deficit syndrome. Um, we have about a 10% incidence in Switzerland in, in, in the children with the symptom and it's much more boys than girls. And this is a German book. I don't know, do you know um, Fidgety Philip? Um, it's, it's a story, it's a German psychiatrist who wrote a book for his three-year-old son and um, he, this Fidgety Philip is a very nice uh, model of the attention deficit syndrome with hyperactivity and the Johnny hat in the air is that of the um, um, the attention deficit part of the illness and um, what we what we see is that that's the boys that's the girls the girls are underdiagnosed we think maybe the illness is quite equally in both sexes but um, the girls are hardly ever diagnosed correctly what why um, because girls with with um, the syndromes they um, they behave different. Um, they withdraw, they adapt, then integrate actively, they do not stand out disruptively, and they hide their exhaustion. During the boys, you know them, you know the hyperactivity boys, you know, you can't miss them. Sometimes they are over diagnosed because every boy who, who's a little bit rude is being diagnosed. But the girls, they are overlooked. So it's quite vice versa in the depression, you know? Depression is a women's illness, um, AHDS is a boy's illness, but it's wrong. It's just because they show the illness in a different way. And we have to be very careful, you know, not to undiagnose them, because they still um, um, are not well adjusted and they are helpless and they are exhausted and get their depression later. So. Do I have, how many time do I have? Uh, we have, you know, an hour, but we can use the time, for, we have to leave a bit of time. For yeah, so yeah. Ten, 10 minutes is okay? That's fine. Good. So, pain is another thing you really should know, because pain is very, very frequent. Um, I would say pain is everywhere. And if you ask in Switzerland, one out of, if you ask 100 Swiss people, only 12% of the men and 6% of the women haven't had any pain in the last year. So pain is quite frequent and we think that about, um, about t nearly 20% of the population have more or less um, frequent pain or chronic pain. So pain is a big problem in the health system. It's quite expensive because it costs a lot of working days. People are off from work. So, um, and usually when I ask students um, who is more prone who, or who is more sensitive to pain, all the female students say, oh, the man, <laughs> my boyfriend, you can imagine. He's so, if, if he's ill, he's, yeah. it's, to be honest, it's not true. It's the female who have more pain. And that is for everything. You see here, that's for pain in the abdomen. More female than male, up to 10%. Um, for headache, for pain in the neck, or for pain in the back. It's always the females having more pain. That counts for people um, older than 15. So why is this? This is because the pain sensors in the, in the female are definitely more sensitive than in men. So if you put your arm in a big tube of hot water, you know, as hot as you can bear it, then the, the woman would f um, put out of the arm more, more early than the men do. 
so they feel the pain earlier or, or, or stronger than the men do. So females are more prone to pain than men. Men can stand more pain than women, that's true. So what does it mean? Does it mean we don't have to take it serious? That's what's happening. Um, but there's a very nice um, method where you can really see what's, what's taking part into the, in, in the brain and that's the PET. You know what a PET is? Yeah. And if you do a PET while um, putting um, the arm in this hot tube, you know, or, or doing, um, cutting somebody with a knife, but I think they use the hot water. Um, then in, in women, there's an activation of the limbic system. And the limbic system relates sensations to the emotional system. So for women, pain is emotional based. Um, in men, there are areas activated that are responsible for cognitive and analytic reactions. So for a man, pain is something he has to explain. But it's nothing emotional. And that's a very big difference and it's very important to know that so you can really understand why men and women talk differently about pain. And it doesn't mean that because a female says oh that pain really bothers me so much and I really can't do anything that doesn't mean you don't have to take her serious she has pain, that pain is real but um, it's a different kind of coping with the pain and of feeling the pain but it doesn't mean she hasn't got it, she has it so women describe how the pain limits them and this sometimes, and they go, go earlier to the doctor, what they always do, we learned this before. So for a doctor it must seem, oh, they are always complaining about pain, another woman complaining about pain, you know, and what happens? Um, he or she doesn't take her for serious. It's, oh, she's just, uh, it's like this all the time, you know. If a man describes how the pain is, he describes it very, you know, like analytical, you know, it's here and here and I have it from the sports and, you know, oh, it's very easy. So, but they ignore it, they don't go to the doctor. Why do they don't it? Because there's a nice Swiss study and it showed that masculinity is associated with enduring pain. So if you say you are pain, you are not longer a master of yourself. And that's very important. So. Pain for a man is a sign of illness and he can become an object of pity and care and he doesn't want to be that. So um, he swallow up the pain. So you have a female going to the doctor saying, oh it bothers me so much and you have a man, doesn't go, he doesn't go to the doctor at all. And that's a problem because both will get a chronic pain problem, what we don't want to have. <laughs> Here, that's a German um, subtitle, you know Klitschko. And he said, testosterone sometimes has advantages. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? We know that testosterone dulls the sensation of pain, while estrogen increases pain levels. So if you have people who do a gender reassignment from female to male, experience less pain. It doesn't mean you have to do this to treat your pain. <laughs> I hope you find other ways to help your patients, you know. But it's still just um, to show you that how difficult it is, you know. It's not just emotional. It's not just in her head, you know. It's real, but it's different. Okay, last one. There's so much more to tell, but that's quite important. Um, and that's infections. There's a very big difference in infections and autoimmune diseases in female and male. And that's a study, and that's another problem we have. Females are not considered in clinical studies um, as far as they should do. And that's a very new study, it's a COVID study, and there's only 4% of the COVID studies who really um, wanted to know the difference between female and male only 4% and that's really a problem. Um, so, men get 
That's just very shortly, but just for you to know. Men get infections more often than women. Um, but they are more susceptible to bacterial infections and they are much more likely to die from tuberculosis or COVID, but females get more long COVID, you know, than urinary tract infections are more frequent in women, but more severe in men. And men get more sepsis and septic, septic shock and die from it. So men are more prone to infections. And that counts for everything except for fungal infections. But for every other infections, males are more prone to, than women for infections. On the other side, that's a list for the autoimmune diseases. Women are much more prone to get autoimmune diseases. That's um, lupus. It's 95% um, female, you know? Or you have atrosis or Hashimoto. Doesn't matter which one. Women are much more prone to the autoimmune diseases. Why is this? Of course, men get some more infection because they do silly things, you know, like going in the wood and hunting. And, but we, we can leave this apart, you know. We just look for, the, for some of the um, tough reasons. One of them is the X chromosome. The X chromosome really helps people um, to prevent infections. So the X chromosomes carry a lot of genes responsible for the innate immunity. And people who have a second X chromosome, you know who this is, that's females, most of the time, are more likely to have more genes read and have better innate immunity. So that's a female advantage. They have a better protection against parasites, a better protection against bacteria and viruses, and a stronger reaction to vaccinations. So we now know that female should need less dosed vaccination levels. But we don't do it. We just give them the same doses. That's not a good idea. They don't need it. But they have more toxicity. So the next thing is, um, this effective immune response that protects women from serious infection promotes the development of the autoimmune diseases. Because if you have a better immune system that's stronger, it's better for against yourself as well. That's a problem. Um, just to show it could be that this X chromosome is very important is the Kleinefelter man, you know the Kleinefelter disease? Um, it's the boys with the quite long arms and the heart failure. They have an XXY chrom chromosome set and they have a 14 times higher risk of lupus than male because of this one more X chromosome. So you should know this in your practice that if you have a Kleinefelter boy, he has a, quite the same um, risk of getting autoimmune diseases than a female. And the triple X woman still have a threefold increased risk of lupus. So it's usually it's very good to have two X, but not if you talk about autoimmune diseases. Okay? There is an explanation we we don't talk, um, we. Oops, we don't talk about this today, but there is an explanation. It has to deal with pregnancy and what the immune system has to do during pregnancy. Um, one reason we have more autoimmune diseases nowadays might be that we have less pregnancies nowadays and the pregnancies could prevent or could help in this disadvantage. But now we, we, we can't tell the woman to have 10 children. That's not a solution again. So you as a doctor or you as doctors, you have to find a better solution, you know. So um, the second point is the hormones. You can think, oh, it's the same. It's chromosomes and hormones. It's not the same. So we have the chromosomes on the one hand and we have the hormones on the other hand. So autoimmune diseases, they often develop during a hormonal transitional phase like in the, when, when the girls grow into females or after pregnancy or in the climacterium or something. And that is due to the estrogens turn on the interferon genes and activate the B cells. And together with this progesterone binds to receptors of the T cells and macrophages. So all the female hormone stuff helps getting autoimmune diseases. And testosterone is immunosuppressive. 
So sometimes it's an advantage to have testosterone, <laughs> you know. So um, and vice versa, if you have a man with a hypogonadism, he will be more prone to have an autoimmune disease. Okay, we stop here. I could tell you a lot of about osteoporosis and Alzheimer and it's very nice but <coughs> I just told you we don't want to get into the details. I just want to give you an overview of what you could think about what could be gender medicine, you know, and why it is so nice to, um, to think about it and really to, to care about it and why it is so important. Because if you really want to treat your patients as single persons, you really have to take into account if they are female or male. And if you are um, more advanced, there's something in between you might um, consider as well, but not in the beginning. So, what you should know. Gender medicine um, is something quite new and it's a new kind of thinking. And what you've seen, we are not only talking about diagnosis and therapy, we are talking about how people behave, you know, what is their health habits, what is their, um, do they um, go to the doctor and what is the bias the doctors have. That all um, t you have to take into account if you really want to do a good medicine. Not only the biomedical system, but you have to in take into account all the biopsychosocial system as a whole. Next thing, it shouldn't be a new discipline. I'm not a fan of saying, oh, that's a wonderful new subject and we need a new professor for gender medicine. I don't think that. I think we should place emphasis on the gender specific perceptive in all our medical training, in our medical disciplines, in our GP practice, you know. That's where the people are coming to. They don't need a gender doctor. Who should go there, you know? You don't have a gender disease, you have an infection, you know. You don't have a gender disease, you have depression. You need a GP that is able to see, oh, that's a male and even he could have a depression. Oh, he's working so hard and he's so ag he's aggressive to his, to his wife. Maybe that's a depression, you know. The GP has to know it, not the gender doctor has to know it. So that's very important. Um, then gender medicine is an aid and a step on the way to a personalized medicine. So it's still important for people who like to do this new stuff. Um, and yeah, I said this. And in order to be good doctors, it's important to consider the differences and to recognize, and that's very important, the own bias we still have, you know? Do you think that's a girl, she can't have an um, activity disorder, or this is a male, he can't have a depression, or this is a female, of course she has pain, don't take it serious, you know. That's all bias we have as doctors, we have in ourselves, and we can work on that, and that's part of the gender medicine as well. And I think if you take home this, that's enough for today. <coughs> Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>